Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another episode of Therapy Talks. It's Haley here. Today on the episode, we have Megan Hamilton joining us. She is the group practice owner of Thrive Collective in BC. She talks about her success transitioning from working in uh, independent practice to becoming a group practice owner. And the focus of our conversations around the business behind her group practice, how to be successful in a group practice, and where she wants to take her future endeavors, including hosting a podcast. Welcome, Megan. I'd love for you to take a moment to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Haley. I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Megan Hamilton. I'm a therapist. I'm a business owner. Um, I support therapists in their practice. Um, I run a group practice and I'm uh, living in the Fraser Valley here in British Columbia. Wonderful. So I'd love to hear about your group practice and your business endeavors. Thank you. Um so I started in private practice in 2014, and I did that um, independently for a few years um, through a wellness center, and that was going really, really well. And I was also working agency as well. And um, then I had a few colleagues who really wanted to work together, and so I took a really scary leap and decided to rent a commercial space and um, create a collective of sorts, which um, allows um, my colleagues and team members to operate their own businesses under the umbrella of my company. So um, we have grown over the years quite exponentially. Um, currently, we have 17 of us, which sounds like a lot. Um, that is spread over three locations in two cities. Um, and I have to say, um, the, the swell of those numbers was um, a direct relationship to COVID um, because we did have seven of our team members have babies during those years. So um, we had to welcome in new people. And then we had those um, colleagues welcome back once they had taken their um, leaves with their children. So it's been quite a journey the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear about that transition from more just pro from just providing one-to-one -one therapy towards like becoming that group practice owner? Yeah, it was, um, it was, you know, nerve wracking, exciting. Uh, I always talk about it as being like exciting and overwhelming at the same time. Um, certainly I've learned about myself that I really love owning a business. I really like being an entrepreneur. And I think the term like therapreneur is out there right now. And I think that that is just like how I'm wired and how I really enjoy um, supporting therapists. So um, I like putting myself out there. I like communicating with the community partners and marketing. And so it just became a real natural thing for me to support my team and the other therapists that I was working with by helping them build their practices um, through that networking. And, um, like I said, we just kept growing and, um, referrals kept coming and the need for services has just grown over the years. And, um, it's been a remarkable journey. Sometimes I, I look back and I wonder kind of how this all came to be. Like it, it's, um, it, it seems like it's quite a fast growth, um, but it also feels really great. And I can't imagine my team, um, with less people and, and we're quite diverse in what we bring to the table. So I also think we're a really rounded group as well. So it's, it's been phenomenal. It's been, um, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it is amazing to have 17 different clinicians all working together. Would you say there's a theme to what you offer or is there quite a lot of variability? You know, overall, I think there's quite a variability. Um, I do take a lot of pride in that. If, you know, if we can't help support you and whatever you're coming to our door with, that will help connect you with somebody else in the community. So um, I, I don't pretend to believe that we can cater and serve everyone who comes through our doors or calls us or sends us an email. Um, but I do make it, you know, my, my personal mission and philosophy to connect community members and clients who we can't serve to someone else in the community. So I've tried to create this, 
um, you know, multidisciplinary wellness center in a sense that has counseling as the heart of our services. And then we have a few add-on services, which includes acupuncture and massage. And we have a registered dietitian who works with us as well. So I did try to take the idea of um, most wellness centers have kind of a counselor or two as an add-on service. And I kind of wanted to flip flip the script a little bit there and have us be a counseling office with other services that complement counseling. Um, so um, I do, I do encourage obviously diversity and, and people who bring different skill sets to the table. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job of that and, and where we fall short, um, that's okay. It's about finding other, um, therapists in the community that we can connect those clients to as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I like what you're saying as having counseling as being at the heart of the services, because I do agree with you, like so often, Many multidisciplinary health practices focus on the body in some way, whether it be diet, acupuncture, massage, chiropractor, uh, physiotherapy. And then there's that kind of, I don't know if I'm saying the right tone, but it's almost like, would you like to try counseling? It's kind of like that little extra. Um, yeah, the add-on service. Yeah, the add-on service. And it's kind of like that extra sort of thing, not really like the the main point or the main um health service like offered. And so I really like how you made it from counseling first and then spread into those other areas. And I can see why that would be so helpful is because you're having ideally a person centered experience. That's really listening to you with non-judgment and helping you to make good informed decisions about your health overall. That's right. That's right. And we worked really collaboratively. Like we get a lot of referrals through our nutrition services and then they're referred for counseling or we have counts, um, counseling clients who then need, you know, with a re recent diagnosis or a, a chronic condition. And so we might connect them for acupuncture. So um, there is a lot of, um, you know, connection and cross referral within our group. And then we also work really well with community partners and other therapists and services in the community as well. Um, so I, I like to think that, you know, if you come through our doors, that will help get you connected where you need to be connected. That's going to be the best service for you, which sometimes isn't us. And hopefully it is, but you know, um, that people can leave, not just going back to Google and not just feeling like, they put all that time and energy making that one phone call and they've kind of reached another dead end. And I kind of like, I'd like to think of us as being a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you because there is a lot of work and energy that a new client to health services may come in and really are being brave to access support and then feel as though they can't find the right fit. And then they're kind of lost. And now they're back on their own trying to get that support. Yeah. Especially navigating insurance, right? You know, people will call and they're like, well, I have coverage for counseling. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Can, can you send me a photo or can you tell me verbally what, what it says that you're covered for counseling and what that looks like? And so helping people even navigate deciphering the language of insurance policies is something that I spend time weekly with people. Again, even if it's not us that can provide the service, but directing them in the right way and, and having them understand what does their coverage even mean? It can be really, it, it's, um, it's pretty unreal. Um, the lack of insight and, 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 you know, companies don't provide a lot of that front end knowledge around what people actually have access to. Um, so spending time with people deciphering their plans is a big part of what we do as well. Mm -hmm. And do you find that? So in BC here, we have like, obviously our public health system, which is great, but it also has its limitations. Do you find that this type of setup, having a one-stop shop perhaps, or a center like this really can help to fill in that void of having disjointed services? I would like to think so, but I, I think that's only been possible with some of our intern students that work with us as well. So although um, each of us that work, you know, under the umbrella of Thrive Collective, we have sliding scale or several of us will do different um, pro bono or, you know, reduced rate sessions, we can't have half of our caseload be, you know, um, reduced rate. And that's, that's really challenging because, I mean, people have limited funds and capacity to pay full rate a lot of the time. So we do supplement. And so um, having interns that have lower rates or sliding scale rates and, and have, you know, ability to see clients for um, no fee is I think part of how we can help to bridge that gap. 
as much as we can. Um, I, I still think there's huge discrepancy and gaps. Um, the need is so great um, for counseling currently um, within Chilliwack and Abbotsford where, where we serve our clients. And I assume it's the same in other communities as well. Um, and I think that a lot of the time it's just therapists don't know how to put themselves out there and to market and, and to tell the public that they exist. And that's kind of why there is a bit of discrepancy where we're full and we're waitlisted, but, you know, also I'll meet therapists who are new or, you know, one or two years in, and they're not filling their books as much as they'd like. And I think that's where sometimes things get a little disjointed is, um, it's hard for therapists to kind of put the word out there and to be visible and, and to be found on Google. And, and so that's been a bit of the segue in, in my work is helping therapists to run their own private practice and be successful and have um, a full calendar of clients because the need is there. Um, it's, it's a huge need. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to hear some of your uh, knowledge or wisdom around helping clinicians to get to that full practice status or waitlisted. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I definitely like to work with, uh, I mean, when I, when I started out, you know, it's kind of that, I, that concept of if I catch, if I cast the largest net, I will, you know, get the most fish, like I'll get the, the most clients. So if I do anxiety, depression, stress, transition, if I do all the things, then I should really appeal to the masses and I should be able to fill my books because I'm doing many areas of practice. And, and I think that that's kind of the first step on where things get a little bit lost in translation for people, because, you know, you can kind of look at this really long list of areas of specialty. And it's like, how can that person specialize in all these areas? Like it can be a little bit off-putting or um, just unrealistic. And I, and I think, although it seems, you know, counterintuitive to pick a few areas that you want to highlight, I think doing that is step one of a, of a long process of how to really focus on serving the clients that you want to serve. And those clients are going to follow you as a result. So um, that's definitely one of the biggest things that I spend time with my, uh, my colleagues when, when they start working with Thrive is to say, okay, well, who do you want to serve? And, and where are the areas of focus for you? Because I think that the list is, is generally too long for people starting out and that can feel overwhelming for, for the therapist um, because we don't know all the things in all those areas, but I think it also feels a bit overwhelming for uh, clients as well. Mm -hmm. and so, so you're really suggesting for therapists to narrow in, to pick more of a niche, to be um, more quality than quantity. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, the caveat to that is recognizing that you can change that. If, if in a year, two years, five years, you want to shift in a different direction, like you can, you can do that. So um, mindset and, and recognizing like, I can do this, and then I can change my mind and do something else or change my focus and approach and, and work with different populations. Um, I, and I think that's kind of initially why therapists kind of limit, they don't want to limit to to a couple niche groups or areas, right? Is that they don't want to be like known for that thing. I don't want to be an anxiety specialist. And it's like, well, but you can, if you want, and then you can also do other things too. Um, it doesn't have to be your, your niche forever. You can, you can change the work that you do. Like that's, that's the beauty of being a private practice owner is it's our own business and we can change um, how we want to work and who we want to work with. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of once you find your niche, what would you suggest is the next step in terms of advertising? Yeah, advertising is an interesting thing with private practice, because generally, therapists don't like to be in the spotlight, they don't like to put themselves out there, they, they feel really nervous about being pushy or salesy, it's like highly uncomfortable. Um, so, um, you know, once we've kind of chosen a couple areas and I've helped therapists to kind of narrow down kind of where they might want to focus, at least starting out, um, you know, is to really choose one method of advertising. So what happens is I meet, I meet new therapists or therapists new to private practice and they're overwhelmed with Facebook. They are confused about Instagram. 
they've spent some time on LinkedIn, they're not listed on Google. Um, so they've tried to really stretch themselves really thin and kind of do all of the things and uh, which results to overwhelm, confusion. Not all those platforms operate the same way and appeal to the same clients. And so they kind of end up trying to do all of the things versus just choosing one thing and doing it really well. Um, definitely having a website is is critical. It's like, it's really a non-negotiable um, thing when you're starting out in private practice. Um, but the second piece to that um, is um, really getting your listing on Google. So I spend a lot of time educating and helping therapists to really um, allow Google to recognize that their business exists. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've met with therapists and they are really overwhelmed and they, they don't know why they're sh not showing up in Google when someone searches their name or their business. And, and it's actually because they haven't told Google that they've started their business. Um, so Google doesn't know you know, that, you know, on March 1st, that you opened a private practice, um, you have to tell them, and then you have to tell them again and again and again, whether that's through um, enhancing your listing, um, you can create posts within Google, um, you can add photos in Google, you can do all these things that help Google to tell you that you're an active business and that you're ready for, for business, basically. And that's something that needs to be added on regularly. Google likes that. And so um, definitely um, doing some community networking is one really big piece that I spend time with. And then Google, those are kind of the main two areas that I um, support therapists and really getting the word out there that they're in business. And, you know, as time goes on and if they want to spend some time on some of the social media platforms, it's definitely an option if that's what they want to do. Um, but many um, private practices can be very successful without even entering the social media market at all. Mm -hmm. And that's, like, the, that's the truth. Yeah, for sure. Because like, when you think about a client searching for counseling, they may, if they feel open and vulnerable and comfortable, they may ask a friend or a family member who they have worked with or that they can recommend anyone. But most of the time it is going into Google and looking it up. Right. And so I definitely agree with you. And I think a good thing to clarify is that you can make, um, it's so that your business shows up on Google and it doesn't actually cost any money if you're not doing any um, SEO advertising and things like that. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so, yeah. And so it doesn't cost anything just to have it so that when you type in your business, it comes up on that right hand side in that little box, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think just choosing one or two things and doing them really well is always going to serve you better than trying to do all of the things. And I think you know, with modern therapy and, and counselors and, you know, mental health influencers being on the social media platforms, I think it's applied a lot of pressure um, to therapists that, that think like, oh, this is the new way and the expectation then for me to get clients and, and, um, you know, like let yourself off the hook for some of that stuff. Um, word of mouth and Google are going to be your top referral sources. Um and so it's really nurturing community partnerships and connections. Um, sometimes that can be through social media. I know for myself with our group practice, I um, liaise and network a lot on our social media platforms with other businesses and other community initiatives. So that's kind of a way that I network through social media, um, which, you know, is a style of marketing, but it's not, I'm not directly trying to market to clients uh, I'm just trying to, you know, um, what's the way to put it, um, present our business and uh, create awareness in our community that we exist. And why is that successful is because so few therapists do that. Um, very few therapists want to be in the spotlight. Well, and exactly what you're saying is like that navigation or that connecting and networking with other businesses. So what kind of things do you do to make those sort of networking connections? Well, I mean, definitely in the early days, it was just telling people that we exist. Hey, we're we're a wellness group in town. We focus on counseling. Just want to let you know that, that we've opened or that we've started or we're coming or whatever that case might be. So a simple note or um, sending a voice message or, or reaching out through social media and telling those businesses that we exist was critical. Again, people cannot know that you exist unless you tell them. Right. So, and, and again, lots of people don't go onto social media to search for a counselor. 
Um, I think for our business, people might go on to see if we do have a online presence on social media, but it wasn't because they were looking for us on Instagram. They just happened to find us on Google or hear about us. And then the social media kind of legitimizes um, that we are in fact a business and exist. Um, um, we've partnered um, for fundraising initiatives. Um, what else have we done in the community? We definitely have hosted groups and workshops at other businesses and locations, done trainings. Um, sometimes we'll do like a food drive for a local organization. So we'll just be really promoting and supporting different small nonprofits. Um, we do those around different times of the year for different reasons. So it's just about also being like a community advocate and a mental health advocate in your community. And, and I think that's some a big part of what social media has allowed us to do is just be that um, agency or in that group that, you know, if, if somebody needs something, we would love to help, whatever that might be, volunteering or promoting or donating. Um, and so that's something that we've spent time doing for sure. That's been really important for us as a group. Yeah. And I think that's definitely a great win-win situation because not only are you guys creating more awareness for your business, but you're also giving back to the community and being a part of the community and supporting everyone. Totally. And I, and I, and I've, t I've given feedback to many therapists, you know, like attending networking functions, um, different um, chamber of commerce meetings, like just thinking about being a mental health advocate, wherever you go, like is so important just for us as a society, but you're also like indirectly marketing, Hey, I'm a therapist in your community and I'm here and I, and I, I have a seat at the table too. And like, that's so powerful. And, and so many therapists just are uncomfortable or don't think like a therapist doesn't really belong in some of those um, circles or meetings. And it's like, no, you do. We, we do as, as mental health advocates and as um, you know, mental health providers need to be attending all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Just we're business owners like anyone else. And so I think it's just so important and valuable and um, great connections always come from all the events that we attend. It's so mm -hmm. important. For sure. And in terms of the social media aspect, do you find that it has become a little bit challenging to navigate some of the ethics around marketing and social media? I mean, I definitely think there's some challenges there. Um, from time to time, we'll definitely get messages of people who are interested in our services. So, you know, having some of those uh, notifications that we don't provide therapy through social media and always redirecting back to our office contact information is really important. Um, I mean, it's, it's challenging because people are spending so much time on social media, right? So, it's not uncommon for people to want to engage with us on social media. And so it's just more of like educating and informing, Hey, thanks for reaching out. Here's the best way to reach us because this isn't a platform that's secure and, and confidential. And so we can't um, navigate that with you on Instagram, for example, or Facebook. Um, definitely having the automatic um, responses set up is something that's been really helpful for us, especially on Facebook. Um, and um I, because how I also decide to navigate um, social media as well as I haven't outsourced that task to somebody like an outside agency or a person. So um, as the clinic owner, I actually manage all of our social media. And so that's been um, like my commitment to ensuring that things are being managed, um, you know, properly, ethically, um, that client information is not out there somewhere with a company or a person somewhere in the world. Um, and that's just kind of been my solution to navigating that a little bit is not only being in control of the voice of our, of our company, uh, my company and, and representing my group of, of therapists who work with me, but also to protect client, um, information and confidentiality. So, um, it's probably the one, the one aspect of business that I have really, uh, wrestled with, um, cause I'd, I'd love to outsource at least some of it, but I haven't. Um, mm -hmm. as a result. I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind because you have that ethical awareness as a counselor. And so you're yeah. able to have better control versus not to disrespect anyone working in social media advertising, but you just have a little bit more clarity and respect possibly for that client. 
Um, and the reason I brought this up too is because I was, I can't remember where I read this article, but it spoke about this idea of clients hearing their stories on social media. And so it wasn't any identified information, like there wasn't a gender or an age or anything really about the person specific or where they lived, but their experiences being shared and being used as examples for different concepts or ideas yeah. and things. And so I think we're kind of in this interesting space where you have to be very conscientious of how we're using social media and like, do we necessarily have to give those real life examples to make our information credible or engaging, or can we just solely stand from a psychoeducational standpoint and give information, right? Or yeah, yeah, I think I think you're making a good point, and I think like we generally give very general, broad information, um, and I use our platforms primarily to talk about the team. So I'm not always talking about, um, oh, we had a client or this is kind of the theme of the week or whatever we're seeing in our therapy sessions, but it's also a way um, to kind of give that consultation information that a client might want from a therapist through some of our platforms. And uh, definitely some of our team members have been more comfortable with others uh, to be on social media. <laughs> Actually, most of my team doesn't even have social media personally or professionally. So um, it's always a challenge to kind of get them in front of the camera and to, to be you know sharing something about themselves. But I've really tried to capture photos and videos of them just being normal everyday people hiking, going for coffee, visiting um, local businesses. And, you know, uh, you know, I'll do some fun promos with my team. Um, we did a giveaway not that long ago. And I said, hey, send me your picture. And for every picture you send me of you in real life, um, I'll enter you in for a draw, right? So we did this kind of fun team, team building exercise where um, I gave away some gift cards for local businesses just to get some more content of my team um, because I think it it just helps to allow potential clients in our community to see that, you know, yes, we're therapists and we're professionals, but we're just real people living in the same community too. And that has been a really cool window for me to show our team is through, through those images and videos and even just being a bit playful too at times. Um, sometimes therapists are so serious, right? And so it can be just a real opportunity to just be approachable and just community members, right? Like that's such a big piece that I like to try to demonstrate through our platforms as well. Mm -hmm. And would you say also um, the main, one of the main challenges of being group practice owner is uh, clinician retention, like staff retention? It hasn't been for me. Um, and I, and I, I, I work with such great people and I, and I, they always say like, no, Megan, like you are the group practice owner. Like you have to take more credit than you're, than you're, than you're taking. Right. So I've chosen to work with some really amazing people. Um, we have had, um, three people in four and a half years move on to different things for different reasons. And I fully support and and respect those decisions, but um, we've we've done nothing but grow. And I think when you can have the right combination of support and autonomy, that there isn't really a big reason for people to to move on. If they're if they want to work in this community, and we start working together, I think you know we can problem solve nearly anything. And and so I haven't had. Uh, a big problem with staff turnover and, and lack of retention. And, and I think that's kind of why I'm still doing this, this many years in is I haven't had those challenges and uh, problems, because that is really taxing and tiring to be, you know, onboarding and, and, and bringing people in and, um, you know, filling their books, and then to have somebody leave. So, um, you know, we just have the we have some good things going on. And so there hasn't been um, a lot of turnover and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that, but I also think it's because I've also chosen some really amazing people that they're just, we're a good fit. They're a good fit for the business. I'm a good fit for them in supporting them. And so it, it's working. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was just curious because that has been some of the feedback I've heard from other group practice owners is that um, therapist retention, because obviously this role can be quite challenging within itself alone, but then to also have a space where you feel connected and feel supported yeah. is huge. And so I, I really like your point around 
finding um, the balance between autonomy and support. Yeah, I I think I take a bit of a different approach than many group practice owners in that I don't consider my colleagues to be my associates. They're not working for me. They're working for themselves and I'm there to support them. I'm there to help market their services. I'm there to help them with the business pieces. I'm not there to manage and I'm not there to, um, I'm there to support, not to oversee. And I think that there's a difference in that. And I, uh, that's just not my leadership style. And I think that I've just found people who appreciate my leadership style. And so that's why, that's why it works. And so um, if someone needed more support than what I was willing to offer, then I, I think it might probably not be the best fit. And, and so I would like to think that at this phase of the business that we could kind of figure that out before they join the team and, and, and navigate that a little bit versus bringing them on and hoping it works out. Um, but we've just had the need for more people and, and there's lots of clients to serve. Um, so it's just gone really well. And I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's gone so well that you are taking on a new endeavor. Um, and that's one of the main reasons we got connected is that you're also interested in starting your own podcast. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I am interested in starting a podcast and I have a couple episodes recorded and um, ironically, I bought a microphone in 2020 um, when COVID happened and I had all this time and I was, um, you know, really, I had so, I have so many ideas. I actually have like ideas for three different podcasts. If you know me, I got a few projects on the go all the time. And um, so I'm uh, launching the podcast later this month here in April and it's called Launch Your Practice. And so the vision of this is to really support therapists who might be new to private practice or might be considering starting a private practice. And I'm interviewing um, other therapists in the community in Canada and, and the States as well who are um, in private practice and just have lots to share about their own journey um, and different areas around burnout, imposter syndrome, um, group practice owners and, and kind of how people have transitioned from maybe agency work or to just this new career. Um, there's definitely been, um, a wave of people who have joined, um, a master's in counseling program as like a second career. And so there just is so much that needs to be shared. And, um, part of this work as well is the, the, to address some of the major gaps in our graduate programs of lack of information and um, courses and programming that doesn't tell us all the things that we need to know about starting a private practice and becoming a business owner, right? So, you know, you kind of become a content creator and a business owner and a digital, you know, you're doing all these things and um, we're not prepared for that in school, right? We're taught so many amazing things clinically and about the relationship and how to, how to work with clients and all these things. But, you know, if we want to go into private practice, um, we're really kind of going to Google and the internet and trying to piecemeal some things together based on where we live geographically. There's different rules and regulations and, and we're kind of winging it. And I know I, I know I did when I graduated and I started privately on my own. And so I just wanted to have this podcast and I, and I also offer some services um, one-to-one -one for therapists who are starting out and um, I'm also offering a course. Um, this will be available online, but um, the first actually um, session will be in person. So I'm doing an all day uh, course on Saturday, May 13th um, in the Fraser Valley for a new therapist as well. So I figured, you know, it's the beta version. It's gonna be a really great opportunity. I have a lot of um, experience facilitating in-person workshops and groups. Um, this is really familiar information to me. So let's just, let's just roll with it. And then I can receive some really great feedback that I can implement for the online course. So I'm really excited about it. I'm super excited about it. Mm -hmm. That sounds so wonderful. And I definitely can relate to all of the things you're saying regarding wearing multiple hats and trying to grow a business. And even for myself, where I'm at in my career, like I'm constantly always thinking the next step or how to improve or 
consistently be full in my practice too, because that is a challenge of mine. And so I think it's really great that you're creating that space because um, I think it's very relatable for every therapist once they graduate from their master's program. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> now what am I going to do here? And how do I become aka successful or uh, fulfilled in my career? That's right. Yeah. There's a lot to navigate. Um, you know, and we're usually working another job and we're trying to start our private practice part-time or we're trying to ease in and, you know, just navigating some of the responsibilities around setting boundaries as private clients and website development. And uh, there's just so many pieces to it. So, um, I, for me, I just found like a real lack of having a concise guide that was really relevant to Canadian therapists where we can go and all the information is there and it's laid out step by step that we can know what to do, know where to invest our time and resources and money. And that's going to help us the most versus a lot of hours of wasted time, you know, putting time and effort into things that maybe don't matter as much, but at the time we just don't know it. And that's really hard, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I would definitely want to sign up for that type of uh, program, I think for sure. Cause I think it takes a lot of the guesswork out of like what to do next. And even just navigating the legality or the, like the technical business things, it's like quite confusing, um, in BC here in this province. And I'm sure really anywhere. There's certainly not always the a right or wrong way, but I can, what I, what I've always, you know, tried to present is like, I'm willing to tell you everything that I've done and where I've spent time that was really valuable. And here's why it paid off. And here's where I totally fell short or wasted time and energy and effort. And, and here's what I've learned and make your own decisions. Like, I think that, that there's such a, a resource there. And I look forward to the participants of the group, whether it be online or in person, having, um, we're going to have a private networking group and have some follow-up calls as well. So it's going to be part of the services that I offer um, because it can feel so lonely um, in private practice, right? Like we're working with people all day, but you know, if we're working virtually or in a really small practice, or even if we're sharing an office with another therapist, you know, we're kind of working opposite them. Uh, we're not usually working together at the same time. So I just think it's important to have a community. And that's part of also what I really want to build as part of these services too, is an opportunity to connect and talk about some of those hard moments as a business owner or learning curves as well. So I look forward to have that facilitating that as well in, in the services that I'm bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. I think that's really great and sounds really helpful because then it allows therapists to get back to what they really want to be doing, which is providing that therapy. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Megan, have we missed any topics that you wanted to touch on? I think we've done such a good um, roundabout so far. I don't think so. I, I don't think there's anything that's been um, missed uh, based on what we wanted to talk about today. I guess if I could leave on on one note or, or word of recommendation, it's just to start, right? If you've been thinking about private practice or, you know, you've been kind of not sure, um, you know, if you're waiting for the sign, this is it. Um, I know for me, I was ready to go right out of the gate from grad school, but it took me a while to decide to leave my um, agency job because I was really unsure, um, you know, leaving um, a really great job when I had really wanted and um, walking away from a reliable income and benefits and pension and all those things. Like I know that for many therapists that, you know, those are what we work so hard for is the security in it. And especially after graduate school, we want to, you know, pay down some of the debt from school and those kinds of things. But um if you're, if you're considering it, like that's speaking to you, right? So there's ways, there's ways to start a private practice. And, um, I just want to encourage people to just be curious about that. Mm -hmm. I think so too. It's just like listening to your intuition and like what your true desires and motivations are. Yes. Do it. Do yeah. the thing. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you joining us today. It'd be great if you could just share, uh, where people could find you. Yes. Thank you. So, um, I do have an Instagram page for my group practice. It's thrive well, BC. And, um, 
um, thrivalbc.com is the website for the group practice. And then um, for the individual consultation that I provide to therapists, um, the Instagram name is launch your practice and people can find me at meganhamilton.com um, just to learn more about my story and read about the uh, offerings that I have. And there's some really great freebies on the website as well. And um, I'll be launching my podcast later this month and people will be able to check it out um, there as well. So I'm so appreciative to be um, interviewed by you today, Haley. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you joining us and sharing. And I think a lot of therapists who listen to this podcast will find a lot of that information very helpful, which in turn, again, gives the opportunity to be back with the clients. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.